Welcome to the Inside EVs podcast for September 23rd, episode 129. Today, Kyle's 3,000-mile road trip to adopt a leaf. Dom takes a Model 3 road trip north of the border, and Tom tests a Hummer EV charging and does a, a bit of light stalking while he's at it. I'm Martin Lee from the EV News Daily podcast, which you can listen to for EV news. It's daily. The clue's in the name. Uh, get it all on Good Podcast Platforms and a couple of the, the bad ones as well. Uh, joining us today is the stealthy Tom Malogny, Inside EV's editor, host of YouTube's State of Charge. Chatamo's latest, biggest fan, Kyle Connor, uh, joining us from the majestic, practically palatial Rivian uh, of Outspec Studios and road tripping Dom Nakyoni, Inside EV's forum moderator and Inside EV's editor. So make sure you hit subscribe, click the thumbs up button, or bad things generally will happen in your life. And if you're watching on Twitch, you can also subscribe to notifications. Let's get into the news. First of all, then, let's talk this big news about the Tesla CCS1 connector to Tesla proprietary standard finally appearing in the uh, Tesla online online shop 250 bucks ships in two weeks and it's got a 250 kilowatt peak charge rate um Tom we'll start with you as you're our guru all things charging is this a big deal yeah it's a huge deal you know um this is something that Tesla owners have been clamoring for for a while and I know you'll you'll have some Tesla owners That'll say, oh, what do I need that for? Uh, we have the supercharger network. The supercharger network's the best network out there. I'm not going to be bothered plugging into those other stations that are broken half the time and so forth and so on. You know what? When you're on a road trip, any port in a storm, and yes, the Tesla supercharger network is great, and it's in a lot of places, but it's not everywhere. And in many instances, people are reporting supercharger locations are backed up. There's, there's too many Teslas there. There's so many Teslas on the road now. So, you know, it's good to have another tool in the toolbox. If you are like Kyle, well, nobody's like Kyle. If you're, if you're kind of like Kyle and you drive a lot, you do these tons of road trips, it's great to have one of these things in your trunk just in case. But if you're the average person that really doesn't do a lot of road tripping you you're able to charge your tesla at home you know a couple times a year you might drive four three four five hundred miles you probably don't need to spend the 250 dollars but if you are on the road a lot buy one of these things put it in your trunk it, it even if it saves you once it's worth the investment i thought tesla would charge more for this 250 bucks for this is um a pretty good price. If you remember the Chatamo adapter when it first came out, I think it was 500, right? 499, so, something like that. Um, and and this is a much better adapter than the Chatamo. It, it lets you, you know, charge at, um, you know, much higher speeds than what the Chatamo adapter limited you to. So yeah, it's a big deal, Martin. Dom, you just took a road trip in a Tesla uh, north of the border. You were driving a relatively new one. Now, these um, adapters only work with newer Model 3s and Model Ys and the refreshed S and X cars produced before 2020, and even some in 2020, don't apparently have the hardware that supports the CCS communication. Um, Dom, in your road trip, would this have been handy, or were you happy on the supercharging network? Uh, I think the super, supercharging network has been pretty good to me so far. Uh, I haven't had any completely full locations or uh, any broken superchargers. The only problem has been like finding them. I had a, like a false. Uh, I ended up going to a place where I thought there was going to be a supercharger. There was no supercharger, and then I, I thought I was like panicking for a moment. Uh, there was something not so far away I could get to, but you know, for a, like. For like 10 frenzied minutes there, I was like, my mind was going crazy. Okay, like where can I find, uh, okay, I have an adapter. I can do like a AC charge, but so this would have allowed me to go to a DC fast charger of a CC, it was a CCS2 connector, like the Electrify America network or, or EVgo or whatever. And then hopefully it would have worked. <laughs> yeah. And, and it would have been fine, but it, it, it was just fine. You know, already because the supercharger network is pretty, pretty darn uh, comprehensive, you know, so far on this trip, at least. Yeah, oh, we're going to get into that at, uh, towards the end, uh, after the news at least, we talk about what you've been driving um, this week. As, as Urban says in the comments, not a problem here in Europe. Yeah, because uh, in Europe, Teslas have a CCS2 connector on the side of the car, like in Germ uh, in China, they have GBT. Um, but um, but of course, in the US, that you have the proprietary connector. Um, now, a 
Kyle, I want to ask, are you going to add one of these to your trunk just for emergencies, or will you be using the newly refreshed EA hardware over the superchargers as these go 250 kilowatts? Well, so we need to talk about the 250 kilowatts because it's technically not within sort of agreed upon spec of CCS. So we'll get into that. I already own two of these adapters now. Uh, I was planning on actually retrofitting our Model 3 aftermarket to accept this adapter. There's a charge port ECU swap that can be done. Tesla doesn't recommend it. I was like, well, if the car bricks, that'll make a good YouTube video. So let's swap it out anyway. And um, But now they have an official uh, upgrade program starting next year for the early cars. And so I think that's what we're going to do with the Model 3 Dom is driving right now is, you know, what, as soon as Tesla allows us to upgrade it, we'll have them upgrade. So it's all kosher inside of Tesla and it's good to be used. Um, yep. I, I know that uh, you are you are the king of amperage and keeping an eye on it's not just about the kilowatts and um, Rando Crypto in the comments says it may be able to handle 700 amps but CCS can only do 500 so it is you know it's not about that peak rate but it's also about the the juice you can get into the car as well. Right. So most of the charging, the public charging infrastructure won't juice above 500 amps on new Model S and Model X with relatively high voltage. You'll be getting 210, 211 kilowatt peak is what I've seen with the adapter on my Model S. On Model 3s, they're a little bit lower voltage. You'll be in that 170, 180 region. Now, the 500 amps isn't really a hard coded limitation. It's very possible that you could get more amperage into this adapter, assuming the hardware can do it. So let's say you find in these next few years, these chargers start to get unlocked above 500 amps, at least the adapter is future-proof. But pretty much any of, the, any of these adapters, the aftermarket ones or the Tesla ones, are all just passive adapters. They just do the communications, and the charger will just give them all the juice that they can that the Tesla is asking for. So I would say the, the charging speed, nice to know. We can at least handle 700-plus amps. And uh, Tom, I'll just come back to you for the final comment on this. I don't know if you if you covered it because I was trying to do the, the the pictures and the mixing. If you mentioned this already, sorry, I blanked out for a second. Is this is this all part of Tesla's CCS plan to access um, the f federal money to build out charging networks? Because they, it, that money isn't available to closed networks of which Tesla's proprietary connector belongs. Um, but is this all part of saying right from January next year or something? I'm I'm just you know, shooting the breeze, but um, from from January, all new superchargers will be CCS. And if our Tesla owners want to use them, because they're built with public money, the federal uh, infrastructure, 7.5 billion odd, then they've got to buy the adapter. Is this part of a larger plan, do you think? So I don't expect Tesla to um, install all new CCS superchargers. You know, we, we still, it's unclear what exactly <clears throat> Tesla's gonna do. They may, uh, let's say on their new supercharger sites that have uh, federal funds involved, they may install, you know, 10 Tesla connector superchargers and then two CCS superchargers. Um, and, and then, yeah, then it would make sense that now their customers can access all of them if they wanted to. Uh, you know, uh, if if they really wanted to 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 eliminate having to put in CCS plugs, I guess they would have um, uh, a, an adapter the other way. So non non CCS uh, non Tesla EVs could then use all the Tesla superchargers. But I don't know if that would fly with the federal funds because now you'd be making somebody purchase something. You know, and uh, to to use it unless it was like tethered to a chain on the on the supercharger, like we've seen the Chatamo adapters tethered to chains on uh, EVgo uh, DC fast chargers, so that Tesla uh, owners can use them. So th it's kind of still unclear exactly the path that Tesla's going to take with, with with this, Martin. Okay, happy to move on. Let's talk a little bit about our next story, which is Tesla's estimated order backlog as of the end of last month roughly about 400,000 cars according to a um a, a well-known uh, twitter a social media poster who follows these things about 102 days of production lower than it has been um in recent years uh, now if you look at the shanghai gigafactory the shanghai gigafactory is down to one week whereas in the us something like the model x long range is 365 days uh, model 3 long range 
all-wheel drive. So from Fremont, that's about 202 days. So it differs wildly. And of course, everyone's got a different opinion depending on whether you are, you know, a lot of people are pro or anti quite hardcore. So either Tesla's got no demand at all or they've got loads of demand and their production is really coming on. But let's talk about what it means for everyday normal people that want to go buy an EV. Uh, Tom, I'll come back to you actually on this. You know... The wait list, I think, generally has been too long for electric cars. Um, Tesla aren't exempted from that. And, you know, we still, I don't think in the UK we can still order an S or an X. It's been two years now. Um, so where are you on the general wait list of cars? And is this a good bit of news for the consumer with this, this time coming down? It definitely is, is, is good news for the consumer. You know, I think Tesla has been monitoring what the backlog was and adjusting prices accordingly, Martin. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, we've seen the prices go up, up, up. Now we know there's been the supply chain problems and their costs have gone up. So you may say that, well, they only did that because they wanted to maintain the same amount of uh, margins and their costs were going up. But I think uh, skeptics might say, no, they, they were, they were just saying, listen, um, strike while the iron's hot. We've got so many people waiting to buy these cars. We can adjust it upwards and let, let's see how far we can push it and, and make as much money as we can, which obviously we're going to reinvest back in superchargers. It's good for the whole Tesla ecosystem. So uh, I think if if that number, if that wait list starts to decline, I think we're going to start to see a pullback uh, on the prices. And uh, hopefully we will, because you look at where Tesla's at now, price wise, compared to where they were just a couple of years ago, and the cars are a lot more expensive than, than what they were. Yeah, and to, the cheapest to get into a Tesla, if we have a look at that, I'll make sure I'm on the U.S. site. So the, the cheapest way you can get into a Tesla, a purchase price of forty six nine ninety for your, your basic rear-wheel drive Model 3. Now, Dominic, I know that you're in the market um, to change your EV, um, and you're looking at things like the, the Bolt with the discounts on that. And, you know, for so many people uh, shopping as you are, like, even to get into a, a you know your entry level model 3 it's just a wildly um you know, out of your price range and so um in terms of the prices coming down yeah wait list can come down but it's not is it really going to affect the prices that much do you think um i mean if they if they see like they need a demand because they're they're building all this um uh, supply with with the gigafactory in austin and berlin and china and and fremont they're building lots of supply so it looks like it's, they're starting to catch up a little bit with demand, but they have all these levers they can pull now if they need to, you know, if, if they don't want, if they want to keep going at full capacity, they could always like lower the price and demand would creep back up because a lot of people are looking at that price and saying, oh, I, I get the Volkswagen ID4 or the, you know, Kia EV6 or something for that price. But, you know, still right now with, with the demand the way it is, it's still super high. You can't even, like on, on the Canadian Tesla website, I noticed they don't even offer the all-wheel drive uh, non-performance version you can get like the rear wheel drive long range or you can get the performance dual that's all you can get with model three in canada right now it's like as far as ordering same with the u.s dom you, you it, can't get the the, the long range uh non-performance uh right. here in the u.s and and that worked out perfect for me because i just sold my dual motor long range 2021 model three just just two weeks ago and the, the the last month the prices have spiked because you can't buy them new so i i ended up selling mine for like seven thousand dollars more than what i paid for it last year that's insane i know that's a great deal that good work insane. if you can get it and there, and there is one of us on this show who has recently taken delivery of a Tesla, and that would be the Model S that um, that, that Kyle is in the shop right now being fixed. Uh, the Model S um, is showing in the US as November to February or November to December for the Plaid. Kyle, how long did you wait to get yours? Uh, I don't exactly remember, but it didn't feel like very long, maybe a couple months at most. And uh, thankfully, we got the notification yesterday that the car is complete, repaired, and uh, we might be able to pick it up as soon as today. Uh, so it'll be quite exciting that we get the car back. How do you think long waiting times have been affecting the buyers of electric vehicles? Do you think it puts people off? Or are they happy to wait? Honestly, I think people are happy to wait. They love to complain about it, but they still <laughs> wait. <laughs> so I, I don't actually think it's that big of a big of a deal i mean at the end of the day where the people who it affects the most are people who need transportation today their car was just in an accident they have no other choice 
and some of these long wait times are forcing them either into the used market for more money or perhaps they are just driving a plug-in hybrid or full combustion vehicle in uh you know instead of a, a battery electric and so i think we would see more adoption if you get cars today i actually backlog it gives people time yeah. to get prepared and uh and also the uh the the planned production state they won't have a bunch of inventory cars just sitting around because sometimes i remember years ago with model s and x when model 3 was ramping up tesla had a bunch of inventory cars and they had to figure out places to stuff them as they were trying to sell them over model 3. now it just seems like all the demand seems to be picking up of course we're in a little bit of a dip right now but so is the economy and i think once things start looking better uh you know we'll see more expensive electric vehicles pick up like tesla's it's interesting you talk about that human behavior side of it, Tom. That's what you did, you know, when the Ford F-150 Lightning was announced, when the Rivian was announced, you put an order in. Like, you didn't wait to see, oh, I'll get some road test videos made and things like that because you knew you are going to be waiting a really long time. They're funny enough, you know, <laughs> to turn up at once. But that's what you had to do. Absolutely. And, you know, I've, I've learned, I mean, we live in a little bit of a different bubble, say Kyle and I, that, you know, we, we have the means to buy the latest and greatest thing to do re reviews, make some videos on it, make some money on it, and they then resell it. So, I mean, I've learned to put in a reservation as soon as it opens on every EV, like I'm waiting for the Equinox EV to, to, to be available. And I'm going to, I'm going to put my, my deposit on it. I didn't do it for the Silverado and I'm kicking myself now. Um, but, um, you know, I, I, I urge some, all of our followers that if you think you might want that EV in the future, as soon as it opens up pre-orders, if the, the manufacturer does that, just throw your hundred dollars down on it. It's a refundable, it's, it's always refundable. So get in line, get in line early. And then, you know, a year from then you, you might be ready for a car, but, um, you know, it's, it's, that's just the state of where we're at right now. And who knows if supply chain issues resolve and if manufacturers start b building more battery plants, they'll catch up to, uh, to, to, to demand. But I don't think that's going to happen for a long time. So it's definitely a good plan to plunk that deposit down as early as you can. It's worked for me. Well, we, it's not in the list of news for the show notes today, but uh, in the news this week, it was a single report from, I think it was a Reuters report, said that Kia uh, would be moving, could be moving their production from South Korea to the US because with the Inflation Reduction Act, you don't get access to those that federal tax credit, the new new one, uh, if it's not made in, a, in North America. So it, it could well be working in terms of more production in the US and those wait lists coming down because you've got to build the cars there and you've got to sell them there. So it could well yeah. work. And I've also heard that China obviously isn't happy about these, these new, uh, you know, mineral sourcings and product and, uh, you know, plant and they're preparing a, a retaliatory tariff moves. So we're going to, we're going to see those probably in place soon. All right, let's continue then. And let's talk batteries, because this, when we put this story up on InsideEVs.com earlier this week, uh, it got a lot of response, even though it's a, you know, it's a little nerdy, a little deep in the weeds. But uh, there's a company in Michigan called Our Next Energy, or One, or O-N-E. Uh, they revealed their anode-free lithium-ion battery cell with very high energy density. Now, it's a 240-amp-hour prismatic cell, but it's anode-free. Let me talk about volumetric energy density. I'll give you some comparisons so it actually makes sense and you've got some context for this. They said it has an energy density of 1,007 watt-hours per litre. Now, if you compare that to BYD's blade battery, which is about 448 watt-hours per litre, that's cell-to-pack technology. CATL's cell-to-pack technology with the ternary cells, the NCM batteries, is about 450-odd, I think. So all around the same ballpark as being twice as good as the batteries that we have at the minute but this company say they're half as expensive to make because of a lack of the anode which is graphite and the manufacturing equipment required to do that now there are some big orders in for these they are going to go into bmw ix's uh, in oh. terms of the test phase um uh, let me come to you, Dom. I know that, Dom, you're, you're, you take a big interest in batteries. Uh, these kind of advances, like this one that we saw this week, what do you think that means for the cars we'll be driving in the future? It means they'll, they'll be lighter and uh, they'll handle better, they'll ride better, they'll go farther on, on a charge because if you have a 100 you know, kilowatt hour battery that weighs a ton, 
it's going to it's not going to take you as far as the 100 kilowatt hour that weighs like 500 pounds so you eliminate all all that weight you get you know an extra i don't know little mileage bonus there as well as and then all your driving dynamics will be you know greatly improved like i'm not strictly so they gave the volumetric weight or the volumetric uh, metric volumetric yeah right yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> um so so that's that's not with the leaders so, so how many watt hours per liter that's not one that i'm super familiar with i always think of gravimetric uh energy as yeah. more important because it's like the, the weight per uh, you know, unit of energy, but this kind of gives gives a good idea that you know half the size they might be around you know half the weight. So that's that's a you know huge advance. Now is if we have all the other you know bases covered, like charging speed, that's also important. Can it take a charge fast? Can it output fast? Uh, reliability in the cold, all those things to have, have uh, come into play. Uh, also, when you mentioned that, so you gave this is their. Uh, volumetric density by the cell, but those numbers you've quoted for BYD, those are the whole pack. So okay. those are those are pretty good. So when they put these cells in a pack, that number will go down somewhat, but it still sounds like it would come up, uh, you know, ahead of where BYD is. And I don't think they gave the, really. I'm not sure they gave the gravimetric numbers, uh, which if right. they're not if they're not boasting about them, they're probably right. not. That's that. That's not the big headline, um, right? But I think you know you're up against some some decent technology that's out there at the minute. Um, and they say what they're going to do, Dom, is they because these cells um, don't uh, they're not the most. Uh, I think in terms of performance wise, they're uh -huh. not then they, they don't compare at the moment. Um, and okay. so uh, the what they think they'll do is they'll make like a, a hybrid battery. So there'll be LFP cells which you would use in your kind of daily charge discharge cycle and then have these for more long-term energy storage or if you're going on a long road trip and it's a bit like in my computer down there um i've got kind of the working ram on whatever it's called mvme you know fast memory and then i also have external hard drives backing up all of my data that i have for the years that i'm probably never going to look at again but it's much much cheaper so it sounds like that uh, could be a solution possibly so Sounds like it has a very low C rate then, so it does, it can't put out a lot of power. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah, so yeah, if you try to give a lot of power, you'll, the voltage will sag, and you, you just won't, you know, it doesn't doesn't have the, like the power output that other cells might have. Uh, yeah, so for storage, that's great. You don't because you don't need that that metric. It doesn't have to be so high. And but so yeah, I don't know. But they're planning on putting this in cars, so I don't know how that yeah. works. They have four customers signed up for 25 gigawatt hours of contract. So it's the real okay. deal. We, we don't talk about this speculation battery stuff week in, week out, because, you know, it, come, it right. comes. Right, there's lots. Um, yeah. But the, they're now going to be, it's called the Gemini battery, and it's now going into BMW iXs later this year as, as test vehicles. Uh, but BMW are a big investor in this company. Um, and BMW in Associated News this week said that they pretty much would stop, and maybe it was last week they said this, they would stop at 600 miles or 1,000 kilometers is kind of a nice round number in terms of range. Tom, is that kind of a, a sweet spot? Because it, I don't know, 600 miles, thousand, it seems like too much. Not that we ever say we've got too much range, but it almost seems like too much. Yeah, I think more has been made out of that statement than what it was originally intended. I think, you know, perhaps the BMW um, rep that said it, and I forgot exactly who said it, was it Zipsy? I forget who, who whoever said it um, was probably being pressured. And I've been at these like interviews where people just keep getting peppered with the same question. Well, how far are these EVs going to go? You know, and probably was answered like, look, um, you know, we see, you know, a, you know, a thousand kilometers as being maybe, you know, a, a, a max of what we uh, what what we could foresee our EVs going. I, I you know, I, I don't think that that's the goal and that you're going to see BMW you know, aim to, to, to make uh, their future EVs go 600 miles per charge. You know, we've said this before, and I've even talked to BMW people about this, that, and many industry insiders do believe that we're going to see ranges increase, increase, increase for the foreseeable futures, five, six, seven years. But then towards the end of this decade, we're going to start to see ranges decrease on the cars and the batteries get smaller lighter and the cost of the cars will come down because the batteries are going to be smaller. And, and why is that? Why would we want less ranges? Well, that we, we, we can live with, with lower ranges once infrastructure has improved. And, you know, in, 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 you know, five to, to, to eight or 10 years, 
we're going to see dramatic changes in the landscape of, of high speed DC fast charge infrastructure. And once there's, you know, ubiquitous DC fast charging everywhere and the cars even charge faster, we can pull those ranges down to 200, 250 miles that, and, and, and you'll, you'll be just fine with that. If, if you could just, you know, drive to the corner and plug in for 10 minutes and add back 150, 175 miles of range, you know, and, and you can buy the car for five, $6,000 less because it has a smaller battery. I think that's what we're going to see. So I, I, I read a lot of articles, uh, when that quote first came out, it, it, some of them framed it in the way that, you know, that's BMW's goal is to, you know, they're going to get to 600 miles on their EVs and, mm. and, and then they're going to stop, you know, uh, I, I think it was just kind of like a, uh, you know, a, a, an off the cuff comment of like, yeah, I don't see any reason why we would make an EV go more than a thousand kilometers. Uh, but I don't think that's going to be their goal, quite honestly. That seems like a good place to segue into the next story that I want to talk about, which is similar, all kind of connected. And that is um, Xpeng. Uh, they announced their G9. Now, let me bring that up for you so you can see that. The G9 is um, a premium SUV. Now, the G9 is going to cost about $75,000 equivalent only in China at the minute, but it's going to charge at 480 kilowatts. Um, it'll do 0 to 62 miles an hour, 3.9 seconds, 96 kilowatt hour battery. Uh, Xpeng are putting in uh, these 480 kilowatt uh, DC fast chargers in China. So that's an, a 10 to 80 percent charge in you know, that's like, that's 15 minutes or maybe adding a hundred odd miles, 125 miles in just five minutes. And it's going to have their version of full self-driving, uh, which is navigation guided pilot. But Kyle, you just spent a good chunk of time in the BMW iX, probably a bit more premium than this, what they call it, a premium, uh, you know, SUV. But in terms of charging, you're doing a loads of road trips and stuff like that. Were you pining for faster charging in the BMW iX with this, with this car have come in handy? Yeah, I mean, always. I'm game for faster charging whenever possible. That sounds great to me. <laughs> um, but, but I think it also matters, will it just peak at this big number for a short period of time and then come down? We don't really know all of the details yet and the temperature windows as to which this can operate in. But it seems really cool. I'm really curious about how the thing's going to hold up over time. And uh, I'm ready for these next-gen crazy fast charging EVs. Bring it on. Yeah, now Tom, you spent some time in China, haven't you, Tom? This was, but the last time you were there, sort of pre-COVID, wasn't it? And it was all, you know, it wasn't this kind of technology that you got to play with. Absolutely, I was actually there when COVID started. I wow. was there in December of 2019. You, you got out just in time. It, 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 it was, was funny you. when I flew in. <laughs> it there was were you. No problems at the airport. All my friends say I was, I was, uh, you know, patient one. And uh, when I flew in, there was no restrictions. But when I was flying out. They were taking your temperature at the airport. Nobody had even heard about what was going on yet. There was kind of rumors that there was, you know, maybe a virus somewhere in the country. And um, it was so weird, you know, but like you don't question what you're what you're they're doing to you in China. You know, you don't say, no, you're not taking my temperature. No, you, know, you, you just stay in line and you, you do whatever they if they want to stick a swab up your nose, you you, you, you say, here you go. You know? <laughs> and um, so uh, uh you know, th that that was happening right when I was there. Um, so but the interesting thing is, Martin, so I got an uh, email about two weeks ago from uh, Xpeng and they said, hey, you know, we've got this G coming out. We're so proud of uh, G9 coming out. We're so proud of the charging. Uh, it's going to charge like a beast. We know that's your thing. Do you want to come over and um, do some charge recordings? Do you want to drive it? You know, we'll give you the car for a week. We'll we'll do a whole bunch of, uh, you know, events with you. You can you know basically do whatever you want and uh, kick the tires. So I was like, that's awesome. But, you know, isn't there still some strict, uh, you know, uh, um, God, I can't think of the word, the quarantine. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Things yeah. In, in, in effect in China. And they're like, oh, yeah, when you get here, we'll put you in a hotel for 10 days. You can't leave. We'll bring you three meals a day. And, um, you know, and after 10 days, you can't you, you can then drive the car. <laughs> I was like, you, you got to be kidding me. I'm not going <laughs> to be in prison for 10 days. I said, you know, if it, call me when that quarantine is down to two days, then I'll, I'll yeah. consider it, you know? So unfortunately I, I can't uh, go over there just yet, but as soon as I can, I will. Um, and they may even bring one over to the U S next year in like 
February. They're saying that if they bring one over, it'll be in California and they'll bring me out there to, to drive it and do some recordings and stuff. So I'm excited to see. And this is great. This is the future. You know, we, we, the fast DC fast charging is going to get marketably better in the, in, in the next uh, five to seven years. It's, it's a little bit of what I talked about before about ranges um, being able to be reduced when, you know, a, t a 10 minute, quick stop at the right, you know, a mile from your house is going to give you 175 miles of range. So, you know, I know I saw there were some comments, people saying, no, 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 what we need is longer ranges. Then you're thinking about the mindset of today. And I understand that. And yes, today we need longer ranges, but if, if, if ubiquitous high speed DC fast charging is all over the place and it works every time you plug up and there's auto charge or plug in charge, you plug in, Zip, you know, you run inside, you get a cup of coffee, you walk out, boom, you added 175 miles of range. You know, if you want to stay that extra five minutes to 15 minutes, now you're at a 225 miles of range. Then, yeah, uh, you know, we can make more affordable EVs and they'll even be more efficient because they're lighter. So yeah. in any event, that's long term thinking. I understand why people look at it here today and say, no, 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 no. We need more range. And um, some people do, you know, Kyle, look at him. He's, he's frozen again. He's, 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 no, he's, he's, he's he, you know, he's driving, uh, you know, he, he can't even stop to do the podcast anymore. <laughs> guys, every week he's in his car driving. He never stops. His well, Rivian that, has like his Rivian's out of warranty already. It has like 90,000 miles on it. He got it a month ago. But um, yeah, I, I, some people would be better for longer range. And I think you'll be able to get that. You'll be able to pay extra and, and have longer range in your car. But the standard EV will have less range than I think what we'll, we'll be shooting for in the next few years. Okay, right. Let's move on. I'll finish up with the news with this story then. And Nissan in the UK, uh, the marketing director of Nissan UK, Nick Thomas, uh, recently said in an interview to Forbes, almost all of the EV batteries we've ever made are still in their cars. We've been selling electric vehicles for 12 years, he said. But I would point out that degradation and failure are not the same thing. So yes, all the batteries may be in the cars, but how well are the batteries doing? He did continue. He said, we haven't got a great big stock of batteries that we can convert into something else. It's the opposite of what people feared when we launched EVs, that the batteries would last a short time. Now, uh, to date, Nissan has a few Leaf batteries, uh, crashed vehicles, warranty issues. They've used in some stationary storage. I think there's one where Ajax play football. They've got a bunch of solar panels on the football stadium, and they've got some storage there as well. But generally, they're not coming out of the vehicles yeah but degradation is different though isn't it so it's all well and good to say well look our batteries are still in the cars but <clears throat> what 50 percent 60 percent 70 percent and what about hot climates now we don't have those anecdotes that i guess you guys have the temperature here is pretty mild most of the year round but um tom is it right that in places like uh, arizona and some hot climates um, certainly early doors, some of those Nissan Leaf owners were having a bit of a shock in terms of temperatures and deg. Oh, absolutely. You know, I give Nissan a lot of credit for coming out with the Leafs, the first, say, mass-produced, uh, fully electric vehicle, um, uh, you know, of, of this era. There were there were EVs back, you know, 100 years ago. Um, but but where, where I have to ding them on it is that, you know, and I think they hurt electric vehicle adoption in not having proper uh, thermal management on the leaf and it, it the leaf more than any other electric vehicle on the market today uh, has has suffered battery rapid battery degradation more, more than any electric vehicle is because they don't have proper thermal management they use a, a simple passive system air cooled if you want it, 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 you want to call it and in the super hot areas like Arizona uh, Texas, um, you know, so some of the southern states here in the U.S. where it's really hot, they've seen accelerated uh, degradation. I think there was a lawsuit back with the original battery. And, um, you know, then they came out with their new battery called the Lizard battery. I remember three, maybe two or three years it was supposed to be more resistant to high temperatures. But even that degrades faster than competitors' batteries do. So you do have these le leafs out there that have 50% you know, battery degradation. And uh, which is much more than than other electric vehicles, even with the same age and and mileage on them. So you know, like I said, I, I give Nissan a lot of credit for coming out with the Leaf, but I also hold them accountable for I think 
causing some some concern in the entire industry when you know when somebody bought a Nissan Leaf and three years later they've lost four bars whatever that means you know the battery's at seventy percent and uh, you know people say I'm never going to get one of these things again uh, you know after after three years of driving uh, I can only go fifty five miles you know from from you know round trip. So um, I think it was unfortunate that that they that's how they engineered it, because it really no other electric vehicle on the market has suffered degradation issues like the Leaf has. Now, one of the sponsors of my podcast is Recurrent Auto, and they do um, battery reports for electric cars. If you're buying a used EV, you get some insight into the battery. Of course, in the Nissan Leaf, you've literally got the battery bars right in front of you. And so in the Leaf forums and things like that uh, people will always be talking about how many bars have you lost and how many bars have you have you lost dominic uh, you look after the inside evs forums what are the the nissan leaf owners talking about with their batteries because nissan are saying like hey you know everything's great everything's rosy uh but and you know i see a lot of conversations saying oh you want you want pre-lizard or no you want the lizard Why, what what does that all mean dominic do you follow these conversations in the forums uh, not not too much anymore. Uh, we don't have a lot of Leaf owners on our farm. We have the occasional ones, but they haven't been talking about their batteries. That doesn't seem to be, you know, an issue. That, that those are that's kind of like a situation where it is what it is. The newer batteries are better, and you know, the people. I think people are just used to. I don't know if they really complain like they did before. I don't think they're well. I don't think they're seeing the, the issues that we're seeing before. And if you look at our, our comments just now, we have a, a few people saying some of these are twelve bars of battery. That's like they're they're. The, uh, the battery health is 12 bars, which is full. Um, and then somebody else said they, said they had eight or 10 bars, which is great. And this is also the uh, same battery that's in the Renault uh, that you had, wasn't it? It's Martin? No, no. I think it was, I think it's a, it's a different pack. I think from the Leaf, I think anyway, from the Leaf to the I mean, well, I think the modules are the same, but like some, yeah. some, they come from the same supplier and they're also not uh, uh, li liquid cooled, right? They're just. It's, it's, so the Zoe, the Zoe is air cooled, and the Zoe right. uses the air conditioning system inside the car, and the right. the um, the hole, as it were, uh, is 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 beneath the rear passenger bench seat. So yeah, when you were when you were charging that very fast, um, and you would hear the air blowing, that's what it was. That's what it would be doing would be to keep the the Zoe batteries um, cool, which of course the Leaf couldn't even do that. So. Right, but you know, um, but that that leads us nicely onto what we've been driving this week, or what we have been driving across the country. Because Kyle, if you got good signal, let's talk about your three thousand mile journey to go and buy the cheapest Nissan Leaf in America, and then let's ask the first question. So, how many bars has your one lost? Yeah, well, I think it's only lost two or three bars. It's still got uh, between 30 and it's, I should say it's about 30 to 33 percent degradation is what we're finding on it. Um, still predicting well over 50 miles of range on the car. It's the original 2012 uh, Nissan Leaf. It was not only the cheapest Nissan Leaf in the whole country, it was the cheapest electric car in the entire country listed for sale. And uh, by a lot, it was, uh, you know, Leafs are typically going the early ones between six and eight thousand dollars. This was thirty seven hundred dollars. I mean, really cheap in comparison. And uh, you know, it's, she's not perfect. It's got got a dent in the side of it, and uh, you know, the onboard charger doesn't work, so it only Chatmo DC charges. But I think it's going to be a fun, fun thing to make some videos with. And we had a great road trip to go pick it up. Uh, Alyssa and I drove out in the Rivian R one T that I'm driving now. We drove from Fort Collins, Colorado, all the way out to Seattle, and then uh, picked up a trailer, picked up the Leaf, put it on the trailer, turned around and towed 1,500 miles one way back to Colorado. And I have to say, towing with an EV wasn't a huge deal. It was kind of fun. Definitely added some time to the trip. It's one of the worst case scenarios for an electric car, but the Rivian tows so well. The infrastructure wasn't as bad as it has been in the past. Um, it actually was free for the majority of the trip right up until the very end. It didn't cost us anything because I think Electrify America has some back end billing issues. They I don't know if they can't figure out how to charge people, how to charge or what was happening. But anyway, it didn't cost us anything more than maybe thirty dollars worth of electricity for the whole trip by the time we were end of it, which at the end of it, which we used, you know, over two megawatt hours, I think, to do this whole. Wow. Episode. So a lot of juice. Uh, how many charges were you blocking with that trailer? Come on. 
Yeah, None. never actually blocked a charger with it. I mean, what? you know me, I'm, I'm pretty particular about icing chargers and stuff, so I, I wouldn't do that. Uh, and I only had to unhook the trailer one time because we would be blocking chargers at a busy location during that moment. But, um, yeah, only had to unhook one time. And uh, all the other times, we either were blocking broken chargers that were just dead happened one time, or uh, we just had space available for everyone. It really worked out great. Uh, did the Rivian consumption meet your expectations? Yeah, so we've done some testing to show that it's all about the aerodynamic profile of the trailer and not so much about the weight. Up here in the mountains, when we're going up over and down the passes, the weight becomes much more of a factor. And so I would say very impressed with the Rivian. We, we averaged 1.1, 1.2 miles per kilowatt hour towing uh, the whole way, which was pretty good. And overall, uh, very, very impressed. Coming up the mountain passes, we were at, you know, 0 0.5, 0 0.6 miles per kilowatt hour. And then going down, the Rivian maxes out at four miles per kilowatt hour. But it was it was infinite because we were regenning the whole time. And it really was was so much fun. And I apologize, but I am going to have to order the Kyle Connor Starbucks drink here. So I'm just rolling up to the teller. <laughs> <laughs> I, you can mute yourself while you do that and I'll, I'll ask i'll ask tom you know would you go in for america's cheapest electric vehicle adding to your fleet or is this uh, a step too far for even you uh, I, I would <laughs> i would probably not buy one i would probably if i were gonna do what kyle is doing i might make a video on listing all of them and like how you can find the cheapest ev but I don't. Yeah. I don't know if I need to. I don't know if I need to buy it and live with it like 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 Kyle does. I already have enough difficulty now driving the Rivian and the Lightning enough so that I can get content with those two vehicles. But I don't also loan my cars out for three thousand mile road trips like Kyle does with, uh, <laughs> with, with with Dom, which we'll get into later. So I think it's funny. And the best thing about uh, Kyle is. You know, when he's happy about something or likes it, he could make anything sound good. He was like, oh, it's got well over 50 miles of range. You know? <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's great. Well over 50 miles. Like, <laughs> wow. I, I, really, I love this leap. And you know what? I feel like it's we, and we're, we're going on this trend where, you know, you guys and us and, and especially us, we cover a lot of the bleeding edge of the EV transition, talking about the most expensive cars, the, you know, longest range, fastest charging. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of people that can only afford a relatively modest electric car. And so, you know, I'm typically on the extremes of things. So I'm like, well, what's the cheapest electric car you can live with? So we went and bought that. And now we're working our way up market. We're in the market now. We're doing a whole series on buying an electric car for under $25,000 used because that's where the federal rebate uh, kicks in. So we're going to be test driving everything at dealers, looking at the options. And that to me is like the bulk of the market. And then we'll work our way up from there. Maybe we'll go into the new, which small electric SUV should we go for? ID4 all the way to Mercedes EQB and so on. And so, you know, we're going to just broaden everything. But I, I got to tell you, I'm loving my leaf. It's not even a joke. I think the thing is so solid. I sat in it last night to kind of play around all the settings and stuff. <laughs> and it was this must have just blown people's minds back in 2012. And you've launched it? Right. Well, of course, everyone felt the earthquakes last week. That's because I launched the Nissan Leaf. And uh, so I apologize if your chandelier fell from the ceiling. And for someone who loves Chatamo so, so much, why buy a car that can only charge? Even the AC charging doesn't work on it. That, like, is that going to be fixed? Are you going to add that to your list of jobs uh, to do, or are you just going to keep the car and just go to your nearest Chatamo charger? Right. Well, uh, you know, I feel like to fully embrace Leaf culture, we kind of need to just sit at the nearest Chatamo charger all day. Thank you, Thank you so much. And, uh, you know, and sort of block the charger. But no, I think in all seriousness, uh, eventually we will fix the onboard charger. We're going to get the thing running nicely. Uh, I think that'll be a really fun series. A lot of the early Nissan Leafs actually do have onboard charger issues uh, from overheating. Surprisingly, that is a liquid-cooled component in the car. You know, the battery pack's air-cooled, but the onboard charger is, uh, is, is thermally managed with coolant. Uh, and so we're going to go through that whole process. We're going to DIY, do it yourself. And I think that'll be kind of fun. Uh, ultimately, we want to, uh, of course, have some fun with an inexpensive car, right? That's cheap and cheerful is always a fun topic to go into. 
But at the end of the day, I think we can really provide some nice consumer advice for someone who really can just afford a few thousand dollar electric car. Here's what we went through, and hopefully your experience will be similar. What's happening here? Yeah, nothing good is happening. <laughs> <laughs> okay, play, you can play it. Yeah, so I totally forgot that the fenders fold down on the trailer until right after this happened. <laughs> and this this is how I had to get out of the car and the trailer. This Not is actually, so graceful. That's footage of Kyle actually being born. <laughs> 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 I believe that's what he says in his tweet there. Yeah. yeah. That's uh, the, the links that you go to for your uh, your channel and your viewers. Uh, well, that's really interesting. I saw a lot of people saying, you know, it's so cheap in terms of the battery storage that you get, you know, it'd be ideal for, let, let me take that off. We've seen that enough times. Uh, you know, it'd be <laughs> ideal for, you know, home storage or even emergency charging of another vehicle. Have you got any plans for that or are you going to leave it as a car and then sell it on one day? Oh, no, we will we'll never sell this Leaf. It's staying in the permanent collection. We're actually in the process of, of moving into a warehouse here in town so we can have more weird cars because that is my passion. And, um, you know, so we'll have space to put them. The leaf will stick around. I think we're definitely going to explore bi-directional modifications, potentially a battery upgrade into the future if our, if our viewers are really curious about that. Again, I think it's a great tool for us to A, remember the past. Chatamo, Nissan Leaf was such an important vehicle to the electric vehicle transition. I've never owned one, and I just feel like I need to own a piece of history. I think it's really wonderful. It's a very low barrier to entry, and they're still right now a very relevant and useful car for many people who just need a cheap, good car to commute in. And so I think we can have fun and educate, and we'll do all the things with it. And, um, yeah, hopefully we don't blow it up in the process. John in the comments says, uh, Kyle getting out of the car looks like the Dukes of Hazard." Yes, uh, 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 Bo and Luke looked slightly cooler getting out. And thank goodness he wasn't wearing his Daisy Dukes while he was doing that. Nobody, <laughs> nobody wants. Like someone described Dukes of Hazards over the phone and then interpreted it. And then that's what happened. Man. Kyle, let me ask you, what year is it? 2012. So that it has the 6.6 .6 kilowatt onboard charger, right? Um, well, currently it's a 0.0, .0 kilowatt onboard charger. I don't actually know what's thought, in it, to be honest. I thought it was 3.3, the, the first, first ones. Well, yeah, they were the first ones. Uh, I, I actually had a reservation on a Leaf when, it, when, it first, when they first offered reservations. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, when I found out that it only had a 3.3 .3 kilowatt onboard charger, I canceled my reservation <laughs> and sent Nissan a big, you know, long letter saying, like, I can't believe you're going to limit this thing to 3.3 .3 kilowatt uh, charging that's insane um you know in 2010 you know that i'd been driving an ev for for two years my mini e could charge at 11.5 kilowatts and i was like i'm not going to trade my mini e in for a, a car that doesn't go as far as the mini e and charges a third as 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 quickly but then they upgraded the um the charger to a 6.6 .6. i don't know if they did it in 12 or 13 though. they did it because of your email you're the reason they charge faster well they didn't respond to me but it was a <laughs> scathing email that like i was telling them how they're ruining electric cars for everybody and did they purposely put a slow charger in it so people don't have a good experience so they're trying to kill the electric car so <laughs> um that's you know really uh, that's just too slow for a bev you can't have yeah. a three kilowatt charge. But, and it, it wasn't like it wasn't available at the time. There were off-the-shelf components, 6.6 .6 kilowatt, char you know, inverters that they could have bought, and uh, they just chose not to. So I'm not sure when you might have the the 3.3 in that vehicle. Either way, I think it's possible to upgrade. So we'll put whatever the fastest onboard charger is in it. Um, but I also think, since we're diving into the weeds a little bit, this one's an SL. It has every option. And so it's got a Sweet. solar panel on the roof to charge the 12 volt battery. It's Sweet. got a heated steering wheel, heated seats. The thing's nice. Mm -hmm. Except well, for that dentist side, yeah, that sounds awesome. It's about two <laughs> two grand more than I think I'd want to pay for it, but you know, <laughs> just well, as, honestly, as a buyer, as a buyer <laughs> of cheap used cars, my, my first car was $600. My second car was $600. You know, my first, my, my truck was like, little under two thousand dollars so I, I buy cheap vehicles generally in, in my past and I, so if i was looking at this leaf with reduced range and a big dent in the side even though it's csl and the nice one no on bar charging you know it, it'd be hard even at two thousand dollars to make a case for it like just as a normal person consumer you know i actually but, totally disagree because the dent's not that big of a deal you can push yeah, it out from the inside 
And right. um, yeah, the onboard charger is the biggest problem, I think, yeah. for the average consumer who might right. be stretching into this leaf that doesn't have an extra, you know, fifteen hundred, two thousand dollars to replace the onboard charger. We're going to try and do it as cheaply as possible in the spirit of the car uh, and do it obviously properly. But um, yeah, I actually think it's a good deal. And honestly, if you wouldn't want to pay up for the money of this leaf, you'd be walking because this is the cheapest electric right. car in the country. You got no option. I mean I mean, then I'd be stuck buying a six hundred dollar gas car. That'd be like steadily pouring, you know, hundred dollars here, a couple hundred dollars there to fix it all the little bits of fall apart. A lot of inflation has happened since you last bought a car. It's that's true. really hard to that's buy that's a car true. that inexpensive. Kyle, true. when you do the the uh, onboard charger uh, replacement, um, you're probably gonna do a video on it and all that stuff. Make sure you first take it to a Nissan dealership and get an estimate, because I think it'd be interesting for to. To, to show when this would cost, look, $1,200, $1,100, whatever it is, you know, just so people know what it would cost to have to replace it if they have to do that. Great idea. And I've heard quotes as high as almost $3,000 for dealers to replace the onboard charger. And hopefully we're able to provide a service by saying, hey, you either don't need to do it or I'll get electrocuted and die and say, yeah, probably worth the three grand. So we'll see. One yeah. of your most uh, popular videos recently was uh, a long video you made interviewing other people as well and, and getting them on a Zoom call to talk about their experiences of DC fast charging in the US. Uh, so how was your 3,000 mile round journey? And, and you know, you have been posting online with more and more new hardware going in, even if it's not fully commissioned yet. Yeah, so the journey went very well, actually. I mean, we were using uh, pretty much primarily ABB chargers the whole way out and then of course the same route back so stopped in a lot of stations twice and on the way out we figured out okay this one's limited to 30 kilowatts this one will give us the 150 um and and pretty much at no point throughout the trip other than i think one charging session did we actually get the maximum that the rivian was asking for so in terms of if you classify a successful charging session like i do as is the vehicle getting everything that it wants the answer was only happened one time out of the 25 or 30 charging stops that we did. However, if you classify a successful charging session as did you get a reasonable amount of energy for you to get out of the station in a reasonable amount of time, uh, let's say 150, 160 kilowatts, which on a Rivian actually does take a little while because it's a big battery, um, then yes, every time, for the most part, we got, except for a couple stations, the 350 amp limitation that's known in the industry for the ABB units, roughly, we got that the whole way out and back. And I got to tell you, it really wasn't a big deal. Our average time charging was definitely longer than I would have liked. It was 30 to 40 minutes uh, for the most part. And then towing sometimes even a little bit longer, had to do a couple hundred percent charges to make some stretches, but we really had a great time. We made the fun of it. We weren't in a rush and uh, it was a really wonderful, wonderful trip. But it's still, you know, you got to swap some handles from time to time when you get to chargers and people are moving around. It's a little bit crazy. But on the topic of new infrastructure, um, a lot of these stations will be upgraded soon with the newest hardware. Uh, ours locally actually had just been put in. Everything's wired. Just waiting for them to hit the on switch and uh, might be as soon as today. We'll see. Wow. Yeah. Well done, EA. And what's the latest on your Rivian service update? The tonneau cover was broken last we heard. Yeah, so, so the Rivian's doing pretty well. The half shafts haven't really started clicking majorly. Uh, I have to say, the more time I spend in this truck, the more I love it. Uh, just getting off 3,000 miles, you know, I have other cars to drive at home as well, really lucky. And this is the one I choose to commute down to Denver for the Mercedes EQS SUV drive I'm doing today. Uh, I really love this truck. And the tonneau cover doesn't work at all at the moment. And that's kind of a pain in the butt. Now, if I really needed it to open, I'm getting that thing open with a chainsaw or not. I mean, we're going to use the thing and we're not letting the truck get in the way of how we're going to use it. But uh, Rivian sent an email to all R1T owners this past week that said, hey, we messed up. We know that the tonneau covers kind of suck and you'll have a brand new one installed, a totally re-engineered fix, hopefully early next year is what it sounds like. So, um, in the meantime, I'm probably going to bring this back into service and have them repair the tonneau cover with a Band-Aid just to get it working. And then I'm going to be expecting a re-engineered version next year in the truck. Uh, Brandon... I never got that email, by the way. Oh. Maybe oh. you have the newest tonneau cover. Unless but, uh, it's stuck in spam or something. I'll, 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 I'll check, but I didn't get I, I didn't get that email. 
a lot of Rivian R1T owners got it. We got comments on the Twitter post about it. That yep, got the email too. So it wasn't just to us. How's your tunnel cover work, Tom? Great. I mean, I've only yeah. opened it once or twice. I've had the truck for a week. I've barely driven it, to be honest with you. I don't think I've driven it 50 miles. My my wife's been driving it, and there you uh, go. I was away for a couple of days, and now one of my friends has it. Well, what I'm doing is I'm going to – I have uh, – where I live here in New Jersey, it's a super rural area, farmland. Everyone owns horses. There's tons of farms. Everybody has a pickup truck. Every – driveway in this town there's a pickup truck kyle knows where i live um really re really super rural area oh by the way kyle i don't know if you know your dad's coming to my house on sunday we're, we're gonna do a video together that's amazing oh, really yeah that's awesome no way. yeah we're gonna do it shoot a video here in the garage in any event it, there's pickup trucks everywhere out here so i have uh some bunch of people that i know that drive them so i'm giving them and these are people that have never driven an electric car I'm giving them my lightning for a day. Then they drop it off the next day and I give them the Rivian for the day. And then I w interview them about, okay, so you've never driven an electric car. You've never driven an electric truck. You're a pickup truck owner. What do you think? Do you think you'd buy an electric truck? Do you think you'd buy an EV? What did you like? What didn't you like? And then talk about the truck that they're currently driving. So I've, 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 I've identified three to five people. I'm not sure exactly how many I'm going to do this to yet. But I'm just giving them the keys. I barely even know these people. I'm like, here's my truck. <laughs> and and uh, they've driven it more than I have the Rivian so far. So I think it'll be a cool video to get a perspective of people that, number one, have never driven an electric vehicle, are kind of rural farming, like, you know, probably not re electric isn't on their radar. And, uh, and to give them these two electric trucks and ask them, you know, do you think it would work and all this stuff. One guy sent me a picture of the lightning and he was actually moving um, to not too far. He was, he was moving that this week and, and he was loading it all up with his furniture and everything. I told them, do whatever you would do with your trucks. And it, a big ottoman fit in the front. And he was like, I couldn't believe this thing fit in the front uh -huh. of your cars, this giant ottoman. He's like, it barely fit, but it, it, it fits. So there, you, you know, you, I said, use it. If you got to go to Home Depot, go pick up lumber with it, you know, and just, you know, make sure this thing could do what you need it to do. So I think that'll be a cool video. I'm interested yeah. to hear what they say after they've driven it, you know, because, you know, a few of them are like, yeah, I wouldn't buy an electric car, you know, and maybe I'll change their minds. We'll see. It'll be interesting. That's a great concept for a video, Tom. But don't tell anybody. It's no copyright. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm not going <laughs> to let anybody know I'm doing this because there's other YouTubers out there that'll beat me to it. You know, right? We'll, yeah. we'll just keep it on the down low, yeah. right? The Talking community of, here won't tell anybody. They like me. No, 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 no. It's our secret amongst 10,000, 20,000 people. Uh, so talking of doing things first, Dom, you road tripped a Tesla for the first time. Uh, Kyle's Model 3 uh, because, you know, the his neighbors are now complaining about his car collection. So you took that off his hands. You've swapped balmy Florida for cold Quebec. How was the journey? Good, bad or ugly? Uh, it's been pretty good so far. Um, yeah, it's been kind of amazing. It's a bit of a blur. So I, I put about 2,000 miles on your car, uh, Kyle. <laughs> uh, it's Tesla Model 3. It's a 2019 uh, Tesla Model 3 Performance. So it's got... So Great in other words, I have, to, I have to it. cut in. You put 2,000 miles on it. So in other words, the car got a break this week. <laughs> right. It's like, phew. Yeah. Woo. Like <laughs> an easy week. I'm not sure how Kyle did 3,000 miles already in, on the weekend in his truck. I'm not sure over time. I mean, yeah, because one of those days was like 16 hours of driving. And I, I didn't have to charge nearly as much as, as Kyle did with the Rivian because I'm not towing anything. But actually his... This car is like, I think the range is somewhat degraded. Plus it's a performance. It doesn't have great range. So a lot of the times I'm going like under 200 miles between superchargers. And there's the one I was at last night in Levy, Quebec. It's just across the uh, river from Quebec City. And uh, I'm actually at the Comfort Inn here in, in Levy, Quebec right now. It's, it's, yeah, it's a hotel room. It's like a <laughs> hotel room. But uh, yeah, so the, the trip has been pretty cool. Um, it's really nice seeing, just seeing the country actually just, you know, just seeing how the, the geography of it all and how it kind of, uh, changes from West to East and it's pretty much a straight line. And so I haven't had any issues with superchargers. Like I said earlier, there have been two, uh, supercharger stations around the Detroit kind of area, Indiana, Detroit, where a lot of, uh, Uber drivers had taken advantage of that Hertz deal. So there was a lot of Uber drivers 
packing into these two stations. They wasn't completely full. I could get it, get in. But one of them, I, I did have to share a charge, and this uh, this one driver was charging their car uh, when I arrived, and they were charging when I left. And I had spoken to an Uber driver the night before, and no one told them about how to charge these cars or how to use them. They they're, they're all charging up to one hundred percent, like sitting there for. A, a, 45 minutes an hour when instead of just doing a quick, you know, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you know, time is money. And, and when you're Ubering and, and I think uh, Hertz needs to do so, include some education, charging education in their, when they hand over the cars and things, because it's, wow. it's not, it's not, it's the infrastructure. It seems to be fine until you add something like this in there, you know, it's different from California where there's not quite as many, you know, Teslas. I mean, there are a lot of Teslas on the road. It's kind of amazing when you're driving across how many Teslas you actually see. It's uh, more than way more than any other brand. Actually, yeah. in in Quebec, it's been there's been a lot, but I've also seen a few more other things. Uh, uh, Mustang Mach E's. I saw two at the same time. They were both around me in traffic, but then at the same time, I saw, you know, there was like three of us Tesla Model Threes, like, uh, mm. you know, going down the highway together. Uh, Anyway, yeah, uh, so, yeah, and you, uh, you, you posted about playing beach buggy racing too uh, while you were right. waiting. To which Carl replied, "R.I.P. Steering rack." <laughs> right. So I, I did two laps, the one one round, the one player, and uh, I was curious because huh? you know the, the, all these games come out and no one really talks about them anymore. You know, they were like hot topics for like a week, and then I don't know, do people even use these? The, the, the cars got all these kind of things that you can do in there while you're supercharging. Uh, so, so I tried this game out. I was kind of interested. I thought you'd have to turn the wheel a lot and stuff. But it's like very small inputs. It's like choo, 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 choo. it's very, and yeah, I don't really have the patience for playing driving video games. Apparently, <laughs> so I went off to the music maker thing. You can make uh, digital tracks somehow. I haven't quite figured that out either, but it's kind of fun to play around with so far. Um, let's see what else we want. Oh, so uh, one neat little thing is. Uh, after driving like, I don't know, 1,500, 1,700 miles, I'm just like driving through Michigan and I spotted this like Hummer EV in, in my uh, rear view mirror. Oh, there it is there. Yeah, look at and that. So like, you can see for our viewers watching on YouTube and Twitch and Facebook, uh, Dom actually managed to get get a picture uh, just in the rear view mirror. Is that a white Hummer following you? It is. It is. It's go, very... going, going through some road, like some road cones there. I can see in the picture. It's difficult to pick out but just yeah at the top there to, uh, uh, to be driving an ev and have an ev behind you what are the chances it's actually driving over the cones actually <laughs> because it's a hummer ev <laughs> yeah. right didn't feel a but, thing didn't feel a thing but it was very distinctive like as soon as that thing came on the highway but i could see it way back in my rear view mirror and then uh, it, i i got behind somebody so it kind of caught up with me and we're back and forth and there was like this sheet hanging down in the window i was like Man, that must be an engineer. I, I was going to try to get a look at the driver, but it did not. Hey, but, can I ask you uh, but, what road? What road was that on? That was Highway ninety four, I believe. Highway ninety four. Hey, uh, Tom, you've been driving a white Hummer this week, haven't you? Yeah. I and where, like, to, whereabouts to, uh, have you been driving that white Hummer? Yeah, you know, I flew out to Michigan to do a seventy mile an hour highway range test and uh, and charging tests on a Hummer. And the funny thing is, I mapped out. I really. I was out of my element because when I go to different places, I don't know where I can do the range test. I have to be able to maintain 70 miles an hour. So I found, and it also has to be a flat route route. So um, I found 94 across the state, basically from Michigan all the way to, I think it's Benton Hills or Benton Falls. It's the other side of the state. It's, it only has about a 250 foot elevation change. So I'm like, okay, this is going to be the perfect route. Um, so I was driving on 94 uh, on uh, Wednesday. Dom, was, was this Wednesday? Yeah, I believe so. I, I, and you have, so, a, did you have a, having to have a sheet hanging down from your, your mirror, your windshield? Yeah, like I, I usually paper? have like my notes up there so i you know when i'm talking to the camera i have the different specs and stuff because i can't remember everything so uh yeah you could even see that white sheet there <laughs> from the windshield so yeah so, this is this is crazy don right. posts a, on twitter a picture like oh i'm in i'm outside of detroit and there's a hummer ev behind me and i'm thinking to myself i'm driving on number 94 and other. so yeah that's me we didn't wow. plan this. Dom is 2,000 miles from his house. I'm 700 miles from my house. And 
we're driving next to each other and he doesn't realize it and he takes a picture of me. Is that nuts? That is un like, you know, just like, unbelievable. What does that happen? I mean, you we could have been back and forth. You passed me a couple of times because I would get behind slower vehicles. And, you know, I think, I believe you went by me at one point and then I went by you again. And I didn't, I couldn't, you know, look up in, inside and see who was driving because you're way up in there. And I'm, yeah. Yeah. So you never <laughs> waved been or beep, blew your horn or, or anything. I didn't realize this until the next day when you posted the tweet. But that's just crazy. I was <laughs> kind of we hoping that we were right this. next to each other. I was like, I wanted to like, get the driver's attention, give him the thumbs up or whatever, because, you know, it was like, this is a, I'll, I'll really have a soft spot for the Hummer EV, even though it's like ridiculous, ridiculous kind of a vehicle for, for yeah, my, it's for ridiculous. myself. But everything about it is ridiculous. Yeah. And that's, okay. I guess we'll talk about that in a second, though. Can we talk about, yeah. Um, are we done with, do we want to talk? I don't know if there's any more questions you want to know about my, my drive. Uh, how long are you going to have Kyle's car for? Uh, oh, I think it's been a couple of months. I think, I think we need to get it back to, <laughs> Before the snow flies in, in December, though, or before December. So basically, yeah, I mean, I just have all of this new Mountain Pass performance suspension and studded big snow tires, and we got to do some videos getting it ready for full snowmobile mode. So I would yeah. say if you're thinking about buying a car, you can borrow it literally as long as you need transportation, you have transportation. I'm not going to ask you to bring it back before you get a car, but don't pull the typical Dom. Start searching. And um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just... Kyle, you're not getting it back. He's going to no, go I, back to a Spark EV after having a Tesla Model no. 3 performance. Give me a break. Well, He's it's gonna, not the best it, example of a Model 3 performance, let's be honest. But we are going to be upgrading it. So, all of the you, Dominic, I'm sure you hear a couple of those suspension rattles and things like that. We are ripping the entire suspension out of it and right. re-putting on lift kit, nice rally suspension. It's going to be so cool. Uh, but the motor is healthy. The battery, yeah, has degraded about 10%. But Model 3s in general aren't long, long, long range cars, especially from this era. The newer ones have a bit more usable battery pack, a bit more efficiency in their drivetrains and, and are a little bit better. But it's also built up some resistance over time because it's had a lot of track use and stuff like that. Um, but I would say... Uh, glad you're enjoying it. I get the notification every time you plug into a charger. I think you got to start stretching it more. I'm I'm seeing you plug in at 10, 15 percent. You got to get down into that. That car only knows five percent and below. <laughs> that's all that car knows. But that's the goal. There's, yeah. I wanted to actually get to this one with like I was I was hoping the five percent, but then it, then it was telling me that I I would have to go below 60 miles an hour to even reach it. And like I don't want to drive below 60 miles an hour. <laughs> <laughs> for like three well, hours keep in mind that it's it's very conservative so you should use the energy graphs and the elevation profile and you can maximize it the tesla's doing its best to not have you run out but ultimately right. what you can do is just say i'm going to ignore everything you're telling me and maybe i shouldn't recommend this if you're still new to road tripping teslas but i would just put in each supercharger manually not to use the trip planner and then you can really maximize your time because I'm seeing you do a lot of 80% charges and above. It's fine. You use the car however you want, but you are wasting time by skipping superchargers. Right. But most of the time at the superchargers, I, they're taking some maybe extra time, but I haven't actually had to wait because I'm off, you know, to the store. I'm, I'm writing notes or I'm doing text to kind of keep up with stuff. And the time it's ready to go, I'm like, I'm not, I'm generally, I'm not ready yet. Awesome. But, well, as long uh, as you're enjoying it, I'm happy and I'm glad that the car is getting used because it sat around for a little while with some issues. I don't know if we mentioned on this podcast. I brought it to Tesla before Dominic picked it up. We put new glass on it. We had to fix a couple uh, like fan shrouds. Things were making noises. We got it back up and running perfectly. And now it sounds like it's doing great on your trip. You're on Martian wheels on Nokian tires. The perfect setup. I'm glad you're enjoying it. Yeah, somebody asked me about the wheels uh, yesterday too. I have a supercharger station. He's like, nice wheels. I know they're Martian wheels. Like, you know, sell, sell them. Nice plug. Great. Nice plug. Yeah. All right. Uh, well, let's move on. We've mentioned the Hummer already. And Tom, that's what you were flying uh, away from home to go and do this week. Now, I gather the full video's not online yet. So we don't want to talk about the whole thing, but we, we've got a graph that we can perhaps show. Yeah. Well, two things. We did the 70 mile an hour highway range test. And that video is dropping on this channel here, the Inside EV's YouTube channel, in an hour. It'll right. be up at 12 o'clock. Don't want to give away the results, but what I will say is, in you know, I, as I do these range tests, I break the range down into quarters each each quarter. Each quarter, the thing went further than a 2014 BMW i3's EPA range rating. Right. So it oh. killed it. We actually beat the EPA range rating 
for the Hummer EV in a 70 mile an hour range test. So wow. that's dropping in an hour. Check out that video. I think it's, uh, I think it, it's it did live really now. Well. What's that? It's, it's live now. Whoa. Yeah. Okay. No, it's, is it? Okay. Well, we have. I scheduled it for noon. It it's on the motorsport player. Or, let me see. Yeah, I guess uh, they, uh, the pushed, they they pushed it out earlier. They must have pushed it out earlier. Okay. Let's right. let's yeah. do let's do seventy mile an hour range test next week on the show when yeah. our viewers have had a chance to watch and digest that video. Yeah. Uh, what else can you tell us though, Tom? So after I did the range test, you know, I have the cars the cars down to zero. I usually do charge recordings. Um, so in the, in the case of the, uh, the Hummer, yeah. So that's what I witnessed. Not good. Um, and what happened was after about, so I, I, I did the range test and I didn't want to put battery preconditioning on during my range test because then that's going to rob the, the vehicle of some, of some, uh, 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 miles. So I ran it down to zero plugged into the super to uh supercharger to DC fast charger, 350 kilowatt DC fast charger. And I was going to charge it up to like 25% and then go drive it back down to zero with preconditioning on, except it shut off at 20%. The, the charging session just stopped. So I'm like, oh, great. I'm glad I wasn't recording this session. I'm going to use the other 350 kilowatt charger at this location when I come back. And I also pinged Electrify America and was like, look, this thing just shut off. It can't happen when I come back and do this charge recording. I flew out here to do this. Look at the back end of the station, see what was going on there and tell me if I should use the same station or the other one. So now I, I'm at 20% state of charge. I go on the highway, drive it. Uh, you know, I had it, whatever, 80 miles of range or whatever it was. I had it, I drove it back down to zero, but on this time I had preconditioning on. So the battery was warming up for like 45 minutes. I get to the DC fast charger, plug it in. After five minutes, boom, it shuts off. Oh. So now I'm like, you got to be kidding me. I, you know, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to really bad mouth Electrify America. So I, I call them up again and I'm like, look, this is ruining my trip. So now they have engineers are looking at the back end and they say, Tom, it's the car. It's not our stations. We are 100% certain we could like send you the, the logs. The vehicle is shutting off charging, not our station. And then an Ionic 5 pulls up, plugs in 230 kilowatts, and he's just ripping along at 230 kilowatts, nothing shutting off. And then an Kia EV6 pulls into the other station where I did, same thing, plugs in, ripping along. So I'm like, all right, it, it is the car. So I said, I'm going to try this again. Now I'm at like 18% state of charge. I go back on the highway. I drove another 60 miles put the preconditioning on again, drove it back down to zero, plugged in, and um, it worked for about seven minutes. Again, it shuts off. But now I unplug, drive over to the other 350, plug it in. It goes back up to like 250 kilowatts, and then it, it, it increases to about 297, and then it buries. You see that drop there? So the, where I actually unplugged and went to the other station happened at like 8% state of charge. You can see where there's that little uptick. That was right when I jumped on the other station. I merged two sessions here because, yeah, right there was at 8% state of charge. Um, but and it, So it continued climbing up to almost 300. And then look what happens. Bang, down to 46 kilowatts. Um, and then it, it, it gradually climbs back up to like 175 and then it tapers back down to 150 and it kind of holds that it goes down to 145 all the way to 65% state of charge. I only charged to 75% state of charge because I, I said, you know, this can't be the proper charging curve for the, for the Hummer EV. And I watched TFL put out a video and they got it to hold a higher state of charger much longer than I did to, I think it was like 45%, but then it dropped, it buried like mine did. And um, so, yeah, you could see there from 18, but they plugged in at 18%. I, I, I plugged in at zero. So you got to have to move that whole charging curve over in any event. So they had the same, it dropped down to like what I did between 120 and 150 for a long period of time. I mean, the Hummer EV really might not be a good, as good a DC fast charging EV as we all thought it was. GM's been talking about how it's going to, you know, they said 350 kilowatts. Um, you know, nobody's seen, I think, over 300 yet, maybe somebody for a little uh, short period of time, but we don't know how long it can hold it. Um, it wasn't a hot day. It was only 75 degrees and it was nice, cool breeze. I preconditioned the vehicle before plugging in. Everything should have been perfect. And, um, 
And, and uh, you know, so I don't know what happens. I've already asked GM to comment on this. I've sent, I actually sent them the recordings of my videos, uh, the recordings of my charging session and this, th this chart here and said, look, um, we need answers. Please let us know what's going on. Can you tell us what the charging curve should look like? Uh, because this is what I'm publishing. And I'm going to say, you know, that, uh, it, it, you know, from what I'm seeing, it's not nearly as good a charging EV as what you, you seem to be promising. So I'm going to have a full video up on this in a couple of days on my YouTube channel, State of Charge, and I'll publish the video on, uh, on Inside EVs. All I can think, Kyle, from watching your outer spec videos, you drove like a first time I've driven the Hummer, but how much testing did you get a chance to do with it? So uh, I actually did some charge testing, but it was out an ABB charger that was 350 amp limited. Um, but in just a week or two, I'll have a Hummer EV for an extended period of time. So I'm going to use the like hardcore. I, I think honestly, the Delta electric uh, EV go stations are the ones that can pump the most juice for the longest because a lot of times you'll have a cable overheat. So like when it dropped to 45 kilowatts, uh, it's very, it's definitely or not definitely, but likely thermal limiting somewhere. And my guess would be in the actual handle of the charger at that point, uh, because that's a, a typical point for it to drop. And then maybe the temperature sensor woke back up and it, it let it juice some more. But but ultimately, hardware, um, we really need to have good hardware in order to do solid charging recordings, uh, which is purely why we're getting a, our own DC fast charger that should be able to output big boy speeds for stuff like this, because as Tom can attest to, it is so annoying having to rely on public infrastructure for this. And the half the time you're doing it, it's the car's fault. The other half, it's the infrastructure's fault. If we can just narrow it down to knowing what exactly the car is doing, then it will help and getting real time logs. And so it's just, it's a big mystery at the moment. I don't think anyone's gotten a solid charge on the Hummer yet. And I think, um, you know, I, I don't even know if we'll be able to given the current infrastructure, we'll see. Kyle, it definitely wasn't the handle. It was cool to the touch. And uh, the, the, before I was, when I went originally, the charger that I recorded this on, there was a Tycon there ripping along at like 260 kilowatts for a long time. When I plugged in, unit, right? Uh, what, what's that? It's a Signet, yeah. yeah and I had, I had a damp rag with me ready, soaking in, in, in ice water for the, for the whole trip because I was, I kept feeling it and it didn't even feel warm. The handle, it felt because we had a, it was really breezy day. When you see the video, you'll see trees behind me waving and everything. Um, so it was a super breezy day and I had that, that ready to go and it didn't charge long enough at a high rate to even warm up the handle. I mean, so, it, Tom, the, uh, the, the temperature sensor in the handle isn't due to temperature. It's actually due to losing communication okay. with the actual charger itself. And that okay. just dips it down to a certain amperage limit. I don't know if that was the yeah. issue. If well, EA is telling you it's the car and you believe it's the yeah. truck, that, that's fine. Because, and I believe that to be true early on. But, but my big question is, okay, this is – forget about Hummer EV. This battery pack's going into Silverado EV, into some of these real mass market vehicles – if these things can't charge reliably, consistently, and fast, we're in for a lot of trouble here. And I also talked, because I talked to Electrify America about this, because they once I started calling them and messaging them, they were afraid I was going to blast them on social media and everything. So they, they were actually very helpful. They're like, okay, we're dialing in. They had somebody watching my charging session, and they're like, 100%, this is the vehicle shutting off, and it's the vehicle. We're delivering the power. The vehicle is asking a hundred a hundred percent of the time so i mean like you said you, 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 as a, you really don't know if it's the vehicle or the or the or the charger but i was at this charging station all day because again i had to drive it down and keep i tried three different times and plus i i charged it in the morning before the range test and i saw a tycon i saw a ev6 and i saw an ionic 5 all rip at over 200 kilowatts for extended periods of time and none of them had any type of of of, of issue so I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty certain it's that. And I even talked to Electrify America more about the, the Hummer. And uh, they said, listen, you know, we've we tested, you know, the manufacturers give the vehicles to these infrastructure companies to do testing. And they said, we tested the Hummer, but it was a long time ago, actually. You might be on three or four versions of software beyond what we've even seen. And that could be causing a problem. You know, so uh, it, this happens. We've, we've talked about this even on the show before. When new vehicles get introduced, there always seems to be some kind of glitches with software between the, the stations and the vehicles. And I don't know what the issue was. We've 
I have Electrify America's side of the story right now. They're like 100% on GM. Don't yell at us. We, we, we'll, we can show you that what the vehicle was calling for, we were delivering. Uh, now I'm waiting to hear from GM. So, uh, you know, they, they, we, we, I, I, I dropped the, the, the file of my whole charge recording and a Google Drive mm. file to GM. Said, look, look at this. What am I experiencing here? What, what's, what's going on? Yeah, it sounds really weird. I'm, I'm really interested to see what happens. We know the Hummer EV has this, this 350 to 700 volt switch, basically that, that goes from parallel to series in their double stack battery packs. Um, this is really interesting. The first of its kind to hit mass production market. Um, who knows? But I will say uh, time will tell. I'm definitely looking forward to playing around with it and seeing what it's out. I'm really looking forward to hearing what GM says um, to you. So will you hopefully get one again in New Jersey to do a real deep dive recording? Uh, you know, the reason why I flew to Detroit was I was told in New Jersey and uh, uh, w there it's booked through November. Wow. Mm. So, you know. So there's one here and, you know, I don't know how I got to the end of the line. I'm usually at the front of the line with electric vehicles from, from, from the, 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 uh, the outlets here that provide the vehicles. But I think General Motors get, when they gave them the vehicle, gave them a, a set list of people that already, that they promised it to. So that's why I went out there and just, I mean, I had one day to do this. I started at four o'clock in the morning and, uh, yeah. and, and, and went out to do the DC fast charge uh, to, to get it, uh, the battery pack warm. I was on the road at like five 30. I wanted to beat rush hour. I wasn't sure how the, uh, the, the rush hour was going to be out there. I didn't want to get jammed up and not be able to maintain 70 miles an hour. So, um, you know, I, I, I was at like 18 hours between the road trip and then all the charging and like Crazy. three times I had a, I had a charge drop charge it to 80 miles and then drive it back down. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, I, I had some fun with it then. I mean, the range test, you know, is boring as hell. You're yeah. just sitting in there going 70 miles an hour. But it's very comfortable, but, isn't it? Oh, uh, yeah. But when I had, when I <laughs> was able to drive it down, um, I was, I was, tr and I was trying to warm up the battery too. I hit the, it's, it's, uh, by the way, it is software limited at 106 miles an hour. Yeah, it's, it's tire limited there, yes. That's that's the rumor, at least. Yeah. That's the rumor. Um, look, final five minutes. We'll quickly mention, uh, Tom, you also uh, compared your Lariat to a, a pro of the Ford F-150 Lightning. And even with the significant price rate uh, rise recently, the, the pro is still really good value in terms of what you get for your money. So you were comparing how these two vehicles charge. Uh, this is on your channel uh, on State of Charge, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I, I actually I haven't had time to embed this in an article on Inside AVs, which I'm going to do soon. So yeah, I just wanted to compare the charging curves of the uh, the standard range battery pack and the extended range battery pack. It charges slower. Um, it's it's uh, on uh, on on uh, on average from zero to eighty percent. It adds about three and a half miles of range for every hour uh, for every minute you're charging, uh, which isn't great. Uh, my my standard range uh, my extended range averages around five and a half miles of range for every minute. So, um, you know, you get faster charging and longer range. So it's a significant difference. I mean, to compare that to other EVs, let's say the Ionic 5 does around eight miles a minute of, of charging from zero to, to 80%. Um, you know, top of the, the, the list is like the Lucid Air. I think it's around 12 miles a minute, but that's way out there. Um, so, yeah, it, it has a significantly um, slower charging capability the charging curves are almost identical though it's just that it it holds a lower rate um for the the whole time in relation to the size of the battery pack but for many people who drive that vehicle it, it, you're not talking night and day so you've said this yeah. before like when you do these comparisons we get into the weeds of a few minutes here and a few minutes there when you start living with a vehicle day to day you know often the time it takes you to go and take a break have a comfort break get a coffee queue up come back charges are often the other side of the car park uh, by the time that you're back it's it's much of a muchness and that we can split hairs but the both cars or both trucks still charge really well yeah you know um i'm, I'm on the, the fence with the with with the pro though to be honest with you the standard range pro because you know that's it's a work truck so there's a little bit of a different dynamic there you're not necessarily having a look lo you know a relaxing cup of coffee and going to the bathroom this thing needs to work and um, I, I, I felt like my lightning with the extended range was kind of just like 
passable for uh, like I, I don't kill for it. I didn't say this thing charges terribly. It doesn't charge great. It could charge faster. It should charge faster, in my opinion. But it was it was OK. It was acceptable. Um, I think the standard range, the fact that it has less range and it charges slower, it might fall out of the acceptable level if you're using this um, to, to, to drive hundreds of miles. I, I, if I had a business, I probably wouldn't buy the standard range if I needed it to cover hundreds of miles on occasion or, or a couple times a month. I, I just think it might be too cumbersome with the, with the slower charging and the less range. But the, most people that buy these, they're not going to, it depends where you live. You know, if you live out in the Midwest, maybe you, you do need to go very long distances very frequently. But many businesses, I have friends that are contractors and, you know, they have, a lot of them have pickup trucks. They don't drive 150 miles in a day, never. And, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> that's fun. It's me driving on the range test. But so for them, this works great. You're, you're charging it on level two at your depot or at home every night you're leaving with, you know, 200 miles of range every morning and it's just fine. But if, if you're going to buy a standard range pro to go, uh, you know, three, 400 miles, two or three times a month, it's probably not the right choice. Get get the extended range battery pack, and that, that's a much better vehicle for that. But it does the same initial um, max power boost that the uh, that the extended range Lightning has. Um, at almost any state of charge that you plug in under 70%, it, when you plug in, you get like six or seven minutes of maximum power, which is good for a short, good push, but... You know, because these vehicles aren't very efficient, even though you're pumping in a lot of kilowatt hour, you're not going mm. very far. Brilliant. All right, thank you for the update on that. Um, next week, Kyle, you can fill us in on driving the Mercedes-Benz. You've been hanging out with Merck this week. Uh, that'll be on next week's um, podcast. You've been even educating some Porsche buyers. We're probably out of time uh, for that. Um, very quickly, if someone is watching the Out of Spec channels and they see part of the uh, the Doggo Rescue series, what do you do? You mentioned that you're doing something with all the proceeds of that particular series on your channels. Right. So all the Dog Rescue series, which we're ramping up even more. Yeah. So 100% of everything the video makes, everything sponsored for it, all the ad revenue that goes to uh, a local organization called Big Dogs Huge Paws based here in the Colorado area. Uh, Alyssa is a volunteer there. And so, yeah, all of that goes to helping with dogs for with uh, behavioral issues to hopefully, uh, you know, get them into their forever homes and live a happy life. So it's a pretty cool, pretty cool thing to do. We love dogs and we're happy to do it. Turn off your ad blockers and make sure you watch those ads on the dog series as well. It all goes to uh, help a brilliant yep. cause. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Next week, I think normal service next week. Dom, are you back home next week or is it me again? Hey, it might be you. That's <laughs> right. I don't mind it. I enjoy Depending it. on how this goes, so, yeah. It's all right. You sent, yeah, me, you, sent me, you sent me the script, so I, and I know it off by heart anyway. That brings us to the end of our show. If you have any questions or comments, uh, leave them on the Inside EV's uh, podcast thread on the forums, our YouTube and Twitch. If you're still watching this, and there's a few hundred people still are, hit the thumbs up. It helps with all the things, the magic that happens in the background, the algorithms. Uh, more people will discover electric vehicles, which is what we all want after all. Uh, so give us a thumbs up if you're on YouTube. Thank you for downloading the podcast audio version, and you can find and follow all of our panelists on Twitter. Tom Malogny is Tom Malog with two M's. I am at EV News Daily. Kyle is it's Kyle Connor on Twitter. Uh, Dominic is at Dominic underscore Y. Click subscribe and tap the bell icon for notifications. We'll see you next week. And if you would, please, Dom, please say ciao. Ciao. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.